very recently. I just graduated Sinai, I just graduated in Critical Care Fellowship. Uh, it's a nebulous topic when it comes to our job, so I'll just specify that I'm in the NICU and the ED in Lutheran. Um, there's four of us, so hopefully you'll see more of the rest of us coming in and giving talks. I'm also doing CQ time in the main campus. And if anyone has questions about pursuing a career in critical care from the ED background or EMI background, feel free to ask me questions after the talk. So uh, this talk is going to be basic. There's not much data to involve. It's kind of bread and butter, but an advanced topic, which is LBAD. So have any people seen LBADs in the ED? Awesome, awesome. Kind of what I said, it's maybe like 10 to 20% of people, and I'm sure it's a lot of phone calls. Uh, but we're going to go over some basics so you're better prepared for the next time to come around. So first of all, what is an LBAD? Well, it's literally, for the newbies, it's an LB bypass device. Uh, you're talking about sucking blood from the apex of the heart and then shooting it out into the aorta. Um, it's run by a pump. There's different types of pumps. And what you're going to see in the ED is really none of this part, just basically this little wire coming out to a box. And we'll discuss all those little parts as we go along. So first, who gets an LBAD? Um, there is criteria, the New York Heart Failure Classification Type 4, which I'm sure you all memorize and study daily. But really, basically, it's stating that <coughs> patients with such severe heart failure that they're having symptoms basically at rest. They can't maintain any EDL, so they'll have shortness of chest pain by simply walking to the bathroom. Um, they often will be on inotropic support. This could be inpatient or outpatient. <coughs> and etiology, while it's nice to talk about, and we talked about the reversible etiologies in the previous talk, but when it comes to this stage of heart failure, they don't really care that much. You're really interested about improving the LB function the best you can. So once they get the LBAD, they get put into these three kind of big buckets. Uh, register transplant, which means that they think the LBAD is temporary and they're going to hopefully get more heart transplant. Mortality in the LBAD is about 80 to 90 percent in two years, which is much improved, better devices. And heart transplants are usually obtained within a year. So this is a factual progress of care. Bridge to recovery uh, means that the LBAD's in temporarily, and you're hoping you can explant it, and the person's LB function recovers. This is uh, fairly relevant to the postpartum cardiomyopathies, perinatal cardiomyopathies, and myocarditis patients. Last is destination therapy, which is actually becoming a little more common because of the improved mortality on the LBAD. <coughs> destination therapy meaning that they're basically going to die on the LBAD. So those are the ones you're probably going to see a little more often in the ED without uh, jumping phone calls. That's something that we have to get prepared for. Last bridge to decision really is like a side category. It really gives the heart failure and cardiac thoracic teams more time to decide are they going to be a transplant candidate or a destination therapy candidate. All right. So the people who should not be getting LBADs, I know this is not our purview. We're not going to be deciding who doesn't get one. But I do think it's important for ED to understand uh, the right time to get heart failure involved. Um, and I think that's often forgotten on the inpatient side, especially community hospitals. Uh, they completely eliminate the idea of heart failure treatment, which includes, in some part, mechanical devices like the LBAN. So if you know people that shouldn't be getting one, you might have a better conversation with heart failure in your future endeavors. So the ones that shouldn't be getting one, anyone with a bleeding risk, because they have to be anticoagulated, obviously. So intracranial hemorrhages, perfused like certain EGI bleeds, any unsafe malignancy that can't be cured, and then the relative contraindications like aortic regurg and liver or renal dysfunction is not due to the heart. So aortic regurg is pretty important. Um, the reason for that, you can imagine if you're shooting blood to the aorta and the aortic valve is incompetent, right? Someone's making that loopy fist motion, it's going to get sucked back into the LVAD, and basically the LVAD will get nicely perfused, but not the human body. All right, so, see, you can't really read those letters. It's my Google formatting, but that's, for now, it's hardware, and that's this bottom pump. And this is the heart rate 2. So these are the two most common pumps. Your site at Downstate, per their website, does uh, the heart rate 2s. I'm not sure how many active they are. It doesn't really matter for us which pump they are. This is just general information for you guys. But the heart rate 2 here runs by an axillary flow pump, like a propeller that shoots blood from the LV and up the aorta. While this, the hardware pump is kind of cute, it sits right in the pericardial sac, while this one sits in the abdomen. And it was, this one's based on a centrifugal pump. It kind of sucks blood into here and then shoots it back up. Oh yeah, this is supposed to be informal, so if you guys have questions of any kind, please just raise hands. Good. All right, so now the kind of meat of the talk. So you're not going to be putting in L badge. You'll probably be managing the MR post-op day one, which you have already seen some of the ED, and what you've got to be prepared for is the complications. Uh, like all of us are 24-7 jobs, 
So you're going to see them in the middle of the night, and the LVAD coordinator is not going to pick up the phone and rescue you. You kind of have to know some basics on what catastrophes could happen and be prepared to resuscitate those catastrophes. Because these are, like I said, viable patients, especially someone who's reached a transplant. So these are the five big categories. We'll hit all of them, and you will be set for the next LVAD arrival. So these are kind of the, you have the ABCs for your basic resuscitation, your board exams, all of the ABCs first, right? Your all boards. Well, when it comes to LVADs, A is still very important, and then this is kind of your B's and C's, more like your C's. You're going to call your LVAD coordinator, which is pretty easy in training, um, but as you get older and you graduate and you move to a community site, which may get LVADs and not be an LVAD center, it's harder to find. Family will be your best bet at finding the numbers to LVAD coordinator. These coordinators are usually MPs. They usually are working with the CT surgeons and heart failure teams on a daily basis. They're pretty educated. They're getting a lot of in-service, a lot of training, so they're really a, an asset to you. Feel free to ask them any questions you need. Vitals. So pulse ox and telemetry are kind of straightforward. Uh, VP is a little more challenging. So some LVADs do have pulse tau flow, and you'll see a little way, you'll see your non of cup give you three numbers, you know, your systolic, diastolic, and math. The map is your most useful number, unfortunately, because that pulsatile flow may not be relevant. It's usually not relevant, and that map actually will have a wide range depending on the patient's intrinsic LV function. So really, if you have an unstable LVAD, you're putting in an A-line. Okay, that map is really what's going to dictate your care. And they do have a normal map and baseline. I mean, the goal is to have them have a map of 65 to refuse their brain, to refuse their organs. So if you drop that A-line in and the map is 55, 40s, it's time to start treating these complications. Nods so far? Some nods. Good. Thank you for nods. Uh, the console. So uh, we'll see a little picture of that. It's basically the patients are at home with their LVADs, you know, cooking. Some actually can swim with their LVADs now, which are better devices. Um, but they have portable batteries so they can walk around. Uh, you'll have the ability to put them on a console if you're at a tertiary center like this. And then you can take away that portable battery flow, take away those portable batteries, and get to a base. The last thing is an echo. This is going to help answer a lot of questions for you. And it's probably one of those really few circumstances where you should be fighting to get an echo in the ED itself. Because it is going to help dictate immediate care. All right. So this, obviously, the pump you won't see. This little box is what you're going to see sticking out of the patient. This is for the heart rate too. It might look a little different for different types of LVADs. But it's basically the same thing. This is the computer that runs the machine. Several wires coming out. This one is going to go straight into the patient called the drive line. The computer cord that connects to the pump, and then these two cords are the batteries. Obviously, two batteries, because when you take one out, you want that computer to have some battery from the other side. All right, so what does this device actually show you? It'll show you the RPMs, which is basically what the heart failure team uses to improve cardiac output. It'll also show you power. By taking the RPM and the power needed to maintain that, it gives you an estimate of the flow. And this is just an estimate, something you'll probably be reading off to the LVAD team not something you'll be using to dictate your care, right? When we talk about complications like this, we're going to look at end organ damage. So your syncopizing LVAD patient or your massively hypotensive LVAD patient. Pulsatility index is basically how strong their heart is working. Not all LVADs are dead hearts. A lot of them have some intrinsic cardiac output, and they actually incorporate that into the decisions they make. And that is the heart failure team, when they decide how fast to spin the pump, they're seeing how much the pulsatility index is, how much does their LV actually do. All right, so now let's get to the complications. Uh, first of all, bleeding. So obviously they can have usual causes, diverticulosis or peptic ulcer disease. They're at risk of those in the general population. But what's more important is to understand is that they're at risk for ABMs. And we're not exactly sure why they develop these ABMs. The idea is that it's non pulsatile flow coming out of the pump, and that for some reason creates ABMs specifically in the gastric area. So these guys get pretty profuse GI um, And then you're going to have a patient with a GI bleed, with an LVAD, with an INR, let's say five. Are you giving this patient PCC? Well, the quick raise your hands. Anyone gonna jump to the gun, give a shitload of PCC? No. Oh, that's good. Okay. Right, it's much easier to treat in the surgical world, right? It's much easier to treat bleeding with blood than a clotted off, in this case, device. Right? So you're not gonna jump the gun and give crap load of volume with FFP, you're not gonna jump to give PCC, you're gonna sadly get access, transfuse. Oh. Makes sense so far? Yes? Are, what type of anticoagulation are these patients generally on? And what's the therapeutic? So they like to be able to measure it, so it's almost always Coumadin. Um, there are some sites that are trying out some of the novel anticoagulants. Um, 
that's usually not the case on the East Coast that I've seen here in Manhattan and the Bronx and Brooklyn. So, Kumi. And then I and your target is? So, good question, good question. Uh, the re there's recommendations to produce, not guidelines. The manufacturer hasn't put out exactly what they want based on studies. From what I recall, hardware runs at like two to three INR, and the hard made two, like 2.5 to 3.5. So it's really up to the heart failure team. Um, if you're, if someone's really on the borderline, that's not really going to be changing your care that aggressively. So between two to three in general. That's top. The ADMs are they usually gastric, intestinal? Usually small and large bowel bleeds for me. So surgery. Well. So, obviously these are not the ideal surgical candidates. You know, your general surgeon doesn't really want to go to the OR with someone with an LVAD, even though they, they do. In a lot of intensive purposes, in a lot of intensive purposes, they can get normal care. Once their LVAD's in and they're supported, um, they're almost better than they were before. Their RV function improves, or distal perfusion improves. But usually it's conservative management, watch and wait. Maybe IR. IR might be a pretty good shot for these patients. But since you're not, fixing the source of the ADMs, right? They're still going to be on LVAD, and you're kind of praying to hold off those options until the very end. Good questions. Good questions. All right. Uh, arrhythmias. All right, so why do you really care? So I can tell you I had a LVAD patient come in right at 5 p.m. So that he's like changing shift, came into the phone, and the patient was in torsades. I was a PGY2, and I was like, it's fine. He has no LVAD. He's pumping blood. Who cares? Let's just let him sit there. And obviously that was not the right answer. <laughs> uh, the arrhythmias are problematic for multiple reasons. One, like we talked about, the pulsatility index, the native LV can be part of the cardiac output that the patient requires. So obviously in arrhythmia, you're not getting good LV flow. What's more important is that the LVADs are dependent on the right side of the heart to function. They have to pump blood from the right to the left. And arrhythmias kind of decrease your right side of that flow. Right? So you should be correcting these arrhythmias. Now, if that means amio, lido, fine. They may need cardioversion. That's okay. That's something you should do. Um, the, you don't need a CT surgeon or heart failure doctor to tell you the LVAD coordinator will probably be the likely person to get approval from, and that's just fine. Or if you do it on your own, someone's syncopizing because they're in torsoft or factory mag, it's sedation and cardioversion. So what we did, we should do fine. Infection. So, like I said, the only thing, you're not going to see the beautiful pump that sits in their pericardium or their abdomen. You're just going to see a little wire sticking out of their belly and going to a controller. Well, that wire can get infected into the belly. And that's called a dry line infection. It's a very common reason for people to show up to the ER. Um, the main things are getting broad antibiotics, okay, on the LVAD team because you're not going to be taking out the dry line. They might get that exchange upstairs. Um, but when it comes to severe sepsis or septic shock, I think it's very challenging how to treat them, obviously. These are our very difficult fluid management patients, right? You don't want to dump in six liters because it's kind of hard to get it out of the patient. You also want to let them be dry. Um, and we'll discuss that in a sec. So your best option may be to just start pressors. So to be honest, this is kind of a population if I was in the community. Well, I am in the community. <laughs> if you're at a site that gets out bad because they're getting, their numbers are going up and they're going to go to your primary centers, not to tertiary centers right away when they're pretty sick. This is the kind of patient you go to A-line, central line, and kind of ship out. Okay, so the reason fluids are so difficult is because LVADs in general are preload dependent. Am I good on time so far? Okay, I can see thumbs up in my head. They are preload dependent, meaning that they need volume in the LV to suck blood out. If there's not enough volume, let's say they have a GI bleed and they've lost a lot of blood, and there's not enough volume in the LV, you'll get what's called a suction event. So that cannula that's sucking blood out will suck against the wall. The machine's response is that's not good and it'll slow down the speed to let the LV kind of fill up again before it sucks blood out. So they're preload dependent and then afterload sensitive. But this, this is all just plumbing. The more you talk to CT surgeons, you realize they're not that smart. They just know plumbing and they get to do cool stuff in the OR. They get to kill people and bring them back to life. Um, but these pumps are not, like I said, not that bright and they're afterload sensitive. If you decrease your peripheral resistance, you'll have more cardiac output which means you'll pull more blood out of LV, which means you increase resuction events. Also, the other way, if you increase resistance, you'll have less flow coming out of the pump. So just because of all these nuances, even if you have all the data, you have the RPMs, you have the echo, you're still probably not going to be dumping in a lot of fluid. That being said, half, uh, a half a liter bolus with discussion with the LVAD team, a liter bolus with the LVAD team might be the right decision for someone in septic shock. 
um, but it really should be in discussion with the LVAD team. Starting pressers, no one's ever going to fault you for starting pressers to keep the LVAD alive. Does that make sense? But they will fault you if you dumped in like four liters of crystal. Okay, questions there? Yeah? Is ultrasounding the IPC so immediately after the other side, the right side of the hard numbers all look better. So the IBC should go back to a normal variant. So it will actually be more reliable. So I think I the, the problem is, though, that it hasn't been studied appropriately for people to guarantee that that's a good value. They will use CDP upstairs. So if you're in a camp that an extreme IBC is equivalent to an extreme CDP measurement, then I would say, yes, you can use it reliably. It really depends on your discussion and how good you are at persuading your LVAC coordinator. Question about the rim is how does your LVAD affect your EKG tracing? Like, you can get a wire complex. So these, line, these people are paced prior. Sometimes we'll keep the wires in, usually they keep the wires out. So I would say there's one pacing of them, but they're apart themselves. The electrical conduction should be the same <coughs> as it was before. So it won't give them like an intrinsic junction with them or anything like that. So, like, how are you going to tell the difference between, let's say, like a stable wire complex tachycardia and a baseline? Their baseline black complex that they have. Well, you're going to have previous EKGs, all uh, right? You're going to take it into clinical contact. So they should really be in sinus function or close to it after LVAD plantation because they've improved the coronary perfusion. And whatever block they have is probably based on most likely bad CAD. So now that you've improved the coronary perfusion, you should, they should be close to a normal sinus, maybe some baseline left bundle. But I think when you're going to see them as a questionable arrhythmia, they're going to be acutely symptomatic. So that's going to help dictate your decision. It's not going to be like a nuanced EKG you're talking to cardiology. It's going to be, you know, the syncopizing, torsades, BTAC patients. Remember, these guys still have diseased hearts from those different etiologies, so they're at risk for all those severe arrhythmias. Make sense? But in the gist of it, it doesn't change your EKG to have an Yeah? Does it all that affect your, like, the sensitivity of your troponin or your DMP? I mean, in the acute setting, you should never send a troponin. I mean, to be honest, why do you care about troponins and BMPs? You're trying to preserve the LV, right? You're trying to see, is this guy having a heart attack, and I need to reperfuse him, I need to get him to the cath lab or whatever. So no, These guys have already lost their LV function, right? There's some intrinsic little bit of sport they have left, and you don't really care. In a post-op period, they should have a troponin, right? You just jam the cannula into their LV. So, tropes, I wouldn't even send them. Yeah. And no LV would I send tropes or BMPs. Cool, any other questions? Good, good. Okay, quick question. Sorry. I thought um, I could answer some. Um, discuss the diagnosis of death in the other patient? Yes, yeah, so that's coming up. It's a good It's a good reason. But I think fine with that. I can see the clock now. You're pushing it. Okay. So it's anatomy changes, this is again, this basically goes over why echo is important. I won't go over each one because of time, but the main thing to understand is RV failure is very challenging, and it's one of the common reasons that they come to the ER. You know, they're, they're dependent on the RV to pump flow, pump blood. And just because our RVs fail doesn't mean they're off the table and they're done. If this is a bridge transplant person, they can get support. They can get medical support of the RV for pulmonology, and they can also get mechanical support for the RV as they wait for our RV. It's not unheard of. You have to remember, these patients who've gotten LVADs, they've also they've already gone through likely dozens to hundreds of hours of evaluation to show that they are a candidate for this support. So if they're in a bridge transplant category, there's a lot of people invested to make sure that this person survives to get that mark. So, and just because they have worse, any of these catastrophic problems does not mean you're writing them off. You're still aggressively doing them there because they need to maintain the next, the next day. Okay, so here's problem failure. So these are kind of all lumped together because they all kind of work together. Obviously, battery failure is fairly straightforward. This is that picture of the console I told you about. This is an example of the Harmony 2 console. This screen is just what's their computer, nothing special. Uh, it's challenging the first time to connect it. It scares you, but once you do it once or twice, you feel very comfortable and it's not that scary to take someone's heart away and switch batteries out. Um, if they're anticoagulated, great. If they're not, what you're going to see is a spike in power. Everything else is going to change. Uh, everything else should stay about the same. What you'll notice power spikes. Good sign that there's a clot, and good sign you should anticoagulate the patient. Um, anticoagulation could be heparin on top of their fluid. Battery failure we just talked about, and dead pulp failure. So obviously when they're dead, you can't really tell. You might even have a little bit of map. Obviously the A-line would be great and kind of give you the hallmark of how they're just refusing. They're obviously going to lose consciousness. You should protect their airway. And the big question is, is if you should do CPO. So, 
anyone's a big fan of Dr. Weingart and his site, he works with these guys in California who've done a, a review, a retrospective, I guess, of autopsies on LVAD patients who have undergone CPR. And it was only about a dozen cases, and none of the LVs got torn apart by doing compressions with the LVAD. I mean, this is sutured in pretty tightly. Uh, and talking to CT surgeons, obviously they want to keep the person alive. If it's close to the LVAD insertion, the right thing is to <coughs> open their sternotomy wires, which could relieve tamponade, which could happen late, it's possible, uh, but also allows you to uh, open cardiac massage. In a lay stage, where you're going to see them, if they're usually, if they're at, this is just me talking and I'm not a CT surgeon, but if they're a year out, things are pretty healed, and if they do die, you probably wouldn't be faulted if you did uh, close chest compression to these patients. Okay, but it's really going to come with a discussion with your LVAD team. As soon as these LVAD people have any problems, they're calling the court here. So court kind of has a heads up when you call them and say like, hey, the guy arrested in my ER, I started compressions, can I continue compressions? Okay, make sense? Uh, final, like, uh, death code, I guess you can just get a death of these patients, it's quite challenging. Um, but if you have an A-line, you can pretty much, especially in destination therapy patients, you can make a decision that they, even though they have pump flow, they're not maintaining a map, they're not maintaining through the confusion. Uh, you're going to need some ancillary testing, most likely, to go down the way death protocols. So it's not up to you. So it'll probably be in concert with the LVAD team. Okay, yeah. So is this mostly a <coughs> mental status thing that you're looking at? Like, right, just like any type of shock state, you want to know an endorphin perfusion, right? So if you have creatinine, you have liver enzymes, but in a cardiac patient, they should have intact mental status completely at baseline, right? These are not stroke patients getting LVAD. These are completely with it, usually 50 to 60 year olds getting out there. So if they're altered in any way, that's a good sign that the perfusion is not working and something's wrong. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so is there a manual So there, there used to be some pumps where you could like squeeze their belly. The new HeartMate 2s and now the HeartMate 3s, which are a little bit discussed at the side of the menu, uh, don't really have that feature. The pumps in the Units in the CTICU will have, there'll be some manual pumps that you can give some energy and keep them going. But those are extrinsic outside the body pumps. I don't have that inside the body. So no. All right, I think that's my time. Any other questions for the finish up? No? All right, thanks for having me.